I've found talking to a lot of people that there's a lot of confusion about the term specified complexity. Even among both supporters and detractors of intelligent design, a lot of people are unclear what specified complexity is. Therefore, I thought I'd uh, put together a little tutorial about what specified complexity is, how to compute it, and what it means. Now, one thing I'm staying away from is I'm trying to avoid how it is applied to origins issues. I find that the heat of the origins issues detracts from the concept itself. So we're going to go through the concept apart from any application to origins at all. Um, that way I think you can have a better idea on what it is and whether or not uh, you agree with its content separated out from an emotionally charging issue such as um, you know the origin of origin and evolution of life. A lot of people say, well, humans detect uh, intelligence where there isn't any. That our intelligence detection mechanism doesn't work properly. And that's why intelligent design can't work, because our, um, our intelligence detection is unreliable. Well, the goal of intelligent design is actually, it actually agrees with this. Um, we agree that our, our intuitions are not necessarily 100% true, but that's the goal of math. Um, you know, in, in uh, our intuitions about physics aren't 100% true. That's why de we developed the subject of physics in order to get a better, uh, a better handle on the truth about physics um, as distinct from our intuitions. And therefore, what intelligent design aims to do is it similarly aims to use mathematics to separate out our intuitions about um, about design from what's actually there and so that we can um, move away from just our in intuitions and have a more objective means of determining answers. Um, additionally, by developing a mathematical model of what, it, what we mean by design, it's a lot easier to incorporate teleology into mathematical notions of the world. So, um, but before we begin, we kind of have to give a little bit of an introduction to bits and probabilities. Now, um, while this is meant to be a tutorial, I'm going to have to assume that you aren't totally ignorant, um, that you know something about probability and something about uh, computer programming. It doesn't take much, but if you know the slightest bit about either one, you should be fine. So start out with a bit. A bit is a binary digit, either a one or a zero. So here you can see that we can count with binary. Um, and bits have started out in their use as a measure of information. So you can say your data is 65 bits long. Usually we do this in terms of, instead of bits, we do bytes, which a byte is simply 8 bits. And then we use terms like megabytes to mean millions of bytes, or gigabytes to mean billions of bytes. But all in all, they all... Um, fundamentally go down to how many bits do you have. Now, um, a probability, as you probably know, is the ratio of expected successes to total tries at something. So if I have a 1 in 50 probability, that means for every 50 times I try it, I'll get success one time. So we can express these as a fraction or even as a decimal. Now, the interesting thing is that probabilities and bits can be converted back and forth to each other. Um, using logarithms. The number of bits is the negative log base 2 of the probability, and the probability is 2 to the negative number of bits. And what this means is simply that if, if you give me a 1 in 64 probability of something, um, that's the same thing as giving me 6 bits of information. So, um, let's say that I were to make up a 6-bit number you would have a 1 in 64 chance of guessing it right in one try, which is the same as you'd have a 1 in 64 chance of flipping a, a fair coin and hitting the number of bit, hitting the, the bit sequence exactly. So um, we, can we will regularly convert between bits and probabilities. But you might wonder, why are we doing this? Well, first of all, bits re represents to... to Bits allows us to represent low probabilities in a much more natural way. 
it's a lot easier to say 100 bits than one in whatever that number is. Um, so, and then using bits allows us to add and subtract components rather than multiply and divide. And so it becomes a lot easier because of logarithm rules. Um, we can we can subtract use addition and subtraction rather than having hairy multiplication and division problems. Um, we can also use bits to allow us to think of probability as a size of information. So a low probability event is a large amount of information. And then when we use bits, um, we can also compare sizes of probabilities with sizes of computer programs. And we'll get to that in a minute. What we're going to start off doing is rather than talking about specified complexity itself, we're going to talk about a related subject called algorithmic specified complexity, which is kind of a shortened version of specified complexity. Um, it, it contains the essential features, um, but leaves a few out. So um, to get a sense of what we're doing, let's say that you were talking to a friend and your friend said that they flipped a coin a thousand times in a row and they got heads every time. Should you believe them? Why or why not? So tossing a fair coin a thousand times and getting heads every time is an unusual occurrence. And so well, how often does it happen? Well, that right there is the probability. So um, I'm not even going to guess how to say that number. It would probably take me the next 10 minutes just to speak it. Um, so the, uh, the raw probability of, giving, of, getting, of hitting a target is known as physical complexity. And we can represent it in bits as the negative log 2 of the probability. So the physical complexity of the coin tosses, um, in this case, since uh, each coin toss is, a, is essentially a bit, um, the physical complexity of the coin tosses is the same as the number of coin tosses. So our sequence is a thousand bit sequence. Um, so for any sequence, we can describe that the physical complexity as CT. Now, is that is that sequence an unusual sequence? Okay. Now it might be it might be your gut reaction to say that flipping heads every single time is an unusual event until you realize that no matter what sequence of coins you flipped, every single one of them would have the exact same probability as flipping heads a thousand times in a row. Um, so no matter what your outcome was the bare physical complexity of it is exactly the same as getting all heads. But of course, we wouldn't think that. If someone said that they flipped heads a thousand times, we wouldn't think that this meant that they just happened to be lucky. Um, but would we have a reason to object? Is there a way to uh, express why we find flipping heads a thousand times to be a surprising event, but other sequence we, sequences, even though they have the same physical complexity, we would describe as unsurprising. And is there a way to express this quantitatively? So first of all, we have to ask ourselves, what is unusual about that sequence of coin tosses? So let's think about the way that we describe this. They got heads 1,000 times in a row. Well. What's another way I could have described the sequence? I could have described the sequence explicitly. Instead of saying they got heads a thousand times in a row, I could have just listed the results and just put a whole trail of a thousand H's in a row. They got H, 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 and so on. So what's interesting though, is that my description is shorter. If I say, they got heads a thousand times in a row, that's substantially shorter than actually listing out the results of the coin tosses. This may not appear significant, but it's actually a very unusual property for any sequence. 
In fact, I can describe this outcome in a 64-bit computer program listed on screen. Um, that program is in Ruby, by the way. Um, I can represent the coin tosses explicitly with a thousand bits of information, but I can describe it with 64 bits of information. So one of the things about information theory is that it tells us that sequences that can be significantly compressed um, are very, very unusual. So if I can describe a sequence with a shorter sequence, that's a very unusual property. And the way to think about this is fairly simple. If I have a sequence that's a thousand bits long, um, you know, I can describe, um, so I can describe it in a thousand bits. Um, the total number of possible sequences is two to the 1000 because we can enter convert uh, between uh, bits and if you raise two to the number of bits that's how many sequences you can describe um, but if I even take off one bit the total number of distinct sequences I can describe is 200 two to the 999th power so that's an order of magnitude difference between the total number of sequences and the number of the total possible number of sequences I could describe with even one less bit. So most of our sequences have to be described with the with at least the full number of bits. Um, and this becomes more pronounced as the sequence becomes shorter. So if you imagine if I only had one bit of information, right? That means I either have a zero or a one. Well, that means I, I can only describe two sequences that way. There, are, there is not, if I, if, if I say, which sequence is it? And you say it's the zeroth one. And I say, well, which sequence, what's the other sequence? You say, well, it's the first one. Well, it doesn't matter which sequence you label with a zero or a one. You can only describe two sequences with one bit, no matter how they are labeled. Um, and so if you have two bits, you can only describe four sequences. If you have three bits, you can only describe eight sequences, and so on and so forth. So the, the smaller, the fewer bits you can describe your sequence with, with the more surprising it is, because most of your sequences um, require the full number of bits. And for every bit less, there's an order of magnitude fewer sequences that can be described that way. Um, so therefore, we can use the ability to describe a sequence using a shorter sequence as an objective way to denote the unusualness of a sequence. So Kolmogorov complexity is the minimum length it takes to describe a sequence. And in terms of specified complexity, we also call this the specificational complexity. How complex is the specification of the sequence? So my, my short description can be reduced until it's roughly 64 bits long. Therefore, for a sequence of bits t, we will refer to the shortest description as kt. Okay? Um, and so for our 1,000 coin tosses, kt is 64. Now, it's actually impossible to know KT exactly, but whenever we find a low KT, we can uh, at least use that as an upper bound on it. Okay, so we, there might be a KT that's shorter than 64 bits, but we know that KT is at most 64 bits because we found a program that's 64 bits long that produces the sequence. Okay, so to compute algorithmic specified complexity, for most sequences, as we mentioned, the minimum number of bits you need to describe it is at least the same as the uh, size of the sequence. Um, if uh, the Kamalgrov complexity of a sequence is 64, then that means that there are at most two to the 64 sequences that can be described with that few number of bits. And really, it usually winds up being significantly less. But um, it's at most to the 64 sequences.
Therefore, the probability of getting a sequence that is quite that unusual is 2 to the 64 divided by 2 to the 1,000th. Um, and we can just we can actually use logarithm rules to convert this to a subtraction. Um, so we can say that the physical complexity of our sequence uh, minus the Kolmogorov complexity of our sequence um, is the algorithmic specified complexity. So we take the number of bits that our sequence is and we subtract it from the number of bits that we can describe it with. And the result is the algorithmic specified complexity. So, how surprising is it? Um, so using Kolmogorov complexity for the uh, to define how complex our specification is, we have an objective means of measuring the unusualness of a sequence. So in our case, the algorithmic specified complexity is 1000 minus 64, which is 936 bits. That means we have at most one in that ginormous number chance of hitting a sequence that's unusual as this one. And just to re reiterate, for most sequences, the Kolmogorov complexity is actually about the same as the sequence complexity. And actually it's technically a little bit greater because there's some overhead just in creating the program. Um, therefore, the chance of getting such a sequence is at most, if you subtract um, the Kolmogorov complexity from the uh, from the physical complexity um, for most sequences it's going to be less than or equal to zero bits. So in other words it's almost certain and since this is an upper bound it's almost certain that when you flip a coin a thousand times you will get an unsurprising sequence. So if someone says they tossed a fair coin a thousand times in a row and the result was that they got heads a thousand times in a row, should you believe them? Well, they only have at most one in two to the 932nd power, 36th power chance of getting a sequence as unusual as this one. So it is by far more likely that they are lying or cheating than that they actually achieved this result. So the bare intuition is that a sequence exhibits algorithmic specified complexity if it has a high, co highly complex physical complexity, but it can be described with a comparatively low complexity specified complexity. So in other words, algorithmic specified complexity is the physical complexity measured in bits of the sequence minus the Kolmogorov complexity of the sequence measured in bits. So what does this number actually do? So the algorithmic specified complexity tells you one thing, how unusual of a sequence that you are working with. Algorithmic specified complexity does not tell you why the sequence is unusual or whether it is likely to that sequence has ever occurred in history. That is, um, we'll have to do some more extensions uh, to find that out. So there's some other extensions to algorithmic specified complexity that are interesting. Um, first of all, um, using Kolmogorov complexity is only one way of determining specified com specificational complexity. It's the most theoretically sound and and most objective, but uh, there are there are indeed other ways of doing it. Uh, to generate a specificational complexity by another means, you you have to there, there has to be two things present. You have to have a means of determining how surprising the result is, and this has to be an a priori method. That means we had to have had this uh, result before knowing what the sequence was. And then you have to have a, a means of determining how many sequences are equally or more surprising. Then you also have partial specifications. Some specifications that you come up come up with may be partial. That is, they do not fully describe the sequence. The specified complexity of a sequence using a partial specification is reduced by the number of ways the partial specification can be realized, measured in bits. So specifications can also be given in natural language as well. 
Um, the size of the specification in natural language can be estimated using 17 bits per word. And that's based on the average size of the, uh, that's based on the size of the number of words that an average person can use on a regular basis. Um, in this case, the specification would be 1,000 heads in a row, which is about 85 bits. Now you have to take care with natural language um, to make sure that the specification is not ambiguous, or else we'll need to follow the rules for partial specification, or a posteriori, which means that the words must have been developed independently of the phenomena being described. So if uh, um, if the word was developed to dis to describe the phenomena, then it is no longer independent. So let's give uh, an example of both ambiguous and natural language specifications. Uh, let's give an example of an ambiguous natural language specification. So we can say the sequence included exactly 800 heads. Well, here the size of the specification is 119 bits. Now, how many ways can we get exactly 800 heads? Well, there's the formula from uh, basic probability that shows you how many different ways we can get exactly 800 heads. And by taking the log, we can find out that this reduces specified complexity by 717 bits. Therefore, our algorithmic specified complexity is 1,000 minus the 119 bits for the specification minus the 717 bits for the number of different ways that that specification can be realized, yielding 164 bits. This is still very specified. Uh, the chances of this happening are at most um, the number given there. It's also possible that the specificational uh, it's also possible that the specified complexity will be negative. Uh, that, um, now, a negative specified complexity uh, taken literally would mean the probability is greater than 1. This isn't really an error, though, because um, specified complexity is actually an upper bound, not an exact answer. Therefore, a negative specified complexity means that our specification does not provide any, um, that our specification does not provide any useful upper bound on the probability. So here's an example of negative results. So we can say the sequence includes exactly 500 heads. And here again our specification size is 164 bits. Well, exactly 500 heads can be obtained in quite a number of different ways. And this actually reduces the specified complexity by about 995 bits. Therefore, if we use this as our specification, then our at algorithmic specified complexity is actually down at negative 159 bits. That means that saying that we got exactly 500 heads didn't really add anything to the specification. It was a likely result anyway. We would have been better off just listing out the results themselves. So, so far we've talked about determining whether a sequence is unusual. But what a lot of people want to know is why is the sequence unusual? So um, we can use algorithmic specified complexity for several different applications. We can determine whether or not a coin or dice are loaded, whether or not research is valid, is the sampling error actually random, whether or not someone cheated an election, is the ballot position actually randomized, and any place where the result is expected to be random but isn't, algorithmic specified complexity can be used to measure this surprise. Now so far, algorithmic specified complexity simply tells us that a result is likely not random. That's useful, but we could make it more useful. Let's look at the following graph. Now if you look at this, the points on this graph are not random. Actually, they follow a line. Therefore, even though the points aren't random, 
their deviation from our proposed system, the line, is likely random. So what we have here is a probability with background information. The line represents background information about the structure of the distribution. Depending on the situation, algorithmic specified complexity may just be telling us that we were wrong to expect a random distribution. Algorithmic specified complexity may just tell us that there's background information that we need to take into account. So now we need to find a way to describe the background information. So we'll call the probability of an event t or sequence t occurring without knowing any information about it as the probability of t. Okay, but the background information will be known as the background hypothesis, or h. So the new probability distribution that is created by the best use of our background hypothesis is, is known as the probability of t given a background of h. So we can adjust algorithmic spe specified complexity using PTH. Um, so if we use PTH, um, that's the measure of the expected distribution given our background knowledge. So if um, the physical complexity of T given H will simply become the negative log two of P of T given H, since we are dealing with probabilities instead of the bare sequence length. Therefore, the adjusted algorithmic specified complexity calculation will be, um, our original one was the physical complexity minus the Komolgorov complexity, and our new one will be the physical complexity um, of the sequence given our background hypothesis minus the Komolgorov complexity of the sequence uh, given our hypothesis as background information. Um, so let's do an example. Let's say that we discover that our coin is not a fair coin, but rather lands on heads 99% of the time. Therefore, if we're operating without this background information, if someone forgot to tell us this, a coin flip sequence will give us a very large algorithmic specified complexity almost every time. However, once this fact is factored out, the algorithmic specified complexity of our sequence of coin tashes should go back near or below zero. So, here is our sequence for 100 flips. Um, the, um, so the physical complexity is 100 if you don't have background information, and the Kamal-Gorov complexity is less than or equal to 56. So our algorithmic specified complexity is 44. Now, if we adjust for a weighted coin, the probability of heads each time is 0.99. Um, heads gives us 0 0.0145 bits of information, and tails gives us 6.6439 bits. And this comes from the negative log of the result. So the physical complexity of the of the sequence for 100 heads um, is is really only 1.45 bits of information, um, but our description of it remains at 56 bits. So our so our adjusted algorithmic specified complexity is actually negative. So therefore, getting a sequence of 100 flips, all heads for such a weighted dice is relatively unsurprising. So what background information are we including? The type of background information you should factor into specified complexity depends on what you are looking for. If you are looking for any regularity or specification, then leaving out background information is appropriate. Um, however, we should note that even deciding what to measure is actually some amount of background information. Um, if you are looking for specifications or regularities except those of type X, then you should incorporate X into your background information. A harder problem is to find specifications of a specific type. In this case, if you found a specification, which is another, which is merely to say a way of compressing the sequence, how do you know 
what type of specification it is. Well, intelligent design, the type of specification we're looking for is a design pattern. Okay, uh, we're, we're looking for something that indicates that the sequence was the result of design. Um, so basically, we're talking about something that's a purposeful act of will. Now, something that is an act of will is not dictated by a predefined law, by definition. Um, but as a purposeful act, it's not haphazard either. Therefore, even using all of natural law as background information, the outcome will still be compressible, as it will still, still be a surprising sequence. Um, and oftentimes, you can actually use the purpose or intention of the sequence itself as the mechanism of compression. For example, um, you know, a building is something that doesn't fall down. Okay, so you can use the design specification to compress the total number of things uh, that could describe the building. Now you can say, um, is it really design? If you found a way to compress the sequence, how do you know you have found design and not just a previous unknown law? Um, well, you can do this using the nature of your compression technique. A law is a simple construction. Giving inputs, it computes a locally simple result. Um, a design, however, can compute a holistically simple result stemming from a purpose. So if you think of a rock, its regularities are generally based on the locally simple patterns of crystallization. But a building's regularities are generally based on the globally simple, simple pattern of not falling down. Rocks do not follow a pattern such as not falling downness or any globally simple pattern. Globally simple patterns may emerge, but only those that can be theoretically expressed in locally simple ways. Globally simple patterns can be designated either by natural language or by test-driven specification or by programs with a high logical depth. Locally simple patterns can usually be expressed by programs with a shallow logical depth. depth. Therefore, when you find a pattern, it's potentially possible to distinguish between the products of design and law. So, if you find an algorithmically specified complex sequence um, where your background information is natural law, it is good evidence of design. It establishes warrant for the belief that the sequence is the result of design. And I should note that if you have more than 8 bits of algorithmic specified complexity, then you are already beyond the confidence of interval of most scientific experiments. Now, can design be excluded? Technically, no. And the reason is very simple. It's based on the math. All of the calculations we've done so far are all upper bounds. It is, it is only possible to find upper bounds for Kamal-Gorov complexity. Computation theory actually says that you cannot find lower bounds for it, at least in a general fashion. So since there's no way to establish lower bounds, you can only establish upper bounds, it is basically impossible to know whether there is an unknown design lurking. Additionally, I should point out that uh, algorithmic specified complexity focuses on um, the epistemology of design. That is, how can we know that we have design, rather than the, the rather than the ontology of design, which is whether something was the was the result of design. And there are um, fewer items for which we can. Um, there are fewer items for which we can know about design than for which um, could be designed. So let me give you an example. If you view um, the action of agency as including that of law, that is, an agent can, do, can have a purpose or will that includes regularities, okay? a regularity which might look like a law. Um, they might, uh, an agent might also want something to look random. 
So an agent could do all of those things. However, a randomness and law cannot look like agency. They do not have the power to do so. And so that's why um, the uh, it's difficult to exclude design, but when you find evidence of it, it, it gives you sufficient warrant to believe it. So, so far we've been talking about um, things, that, things that you identify in the present. Whether or not a given sequence is likely to have occurred right now. But we might have, uh, someone might ask the question, has the given sequence ever occurred by chance in the history of the universe? Um, has something happened at some point that's a frozen accident? And so what we see is the result of chance. It just happened to be something that was frozen there uh, many eons ago, um, but using many billions of years uh, to achieve. So um, the probabilities we've dealt with so far are limited to our expectations with daily life. But how does this change if we add in a large amount of time? A lot of people think that large amounts of time cover all sorts of probabilities. In the origin of life problem, uh, could a really improbable event occur once that leads to self-replication and therefore probable events from there on out? So, the, as, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, the nice thing about math is that it allows us to be objective about these things rather than just dealing with our intuitions. So, um, some people have the belief that time makes the improbable probable, or even certain. So the argument is that time is so incomprehensibly vast that it can accommodate any improbability. However, most people agree that the history of the universe is finite, and the amount of matter in the universe is finite. And given those two assumptions, we can actually calculate upper bounds on the impact that time and space have on probability calculations. So, let's say that I have a probability of 1 in 10,000 of entering a contest. Well, that's pretty unlikely. However, if I participate in 50,000 such contests, my chances of winning at least one are actually very good. Um, the number of times we can enter into a contest is the probability resources. And you can even factor this out into actors and attempts. So if I have a probability P of 1 in 100,000, but we have 10 people each making 5 attempts, we can call the number of actors M and the number of attempts each one makes N. Um, the exact calculation of how this affects probability is ra rather difficult. Um, it's uh, 1 minus 1 minus p raised to the m times n power. Okay, But um, to simplify things, we can use Boole's inequality. We can make an upper bound just by multiplying m times n times the probability. And that, so m times n times the probability is greater than the actual probability. So we can just use m times n as a stand-in. Um, since this will make the event seem even more probable, it means that it will not do any damage to specified complexity, since it itself is an upper bound. So use, using bits, we can merely subtract out log, uh, log 2 of m times n to account for the actors and the attempts. So, the, going back to our, um, head, our heads example, this algorithmic specified complexity of getting a thousand heads in a row was 936 bits. If I have a million people try, try this 10 million times, will the outcome still be unlikely? Well, here's m, here's n, and the log 2 of m times n is 43. So it only removes 43 bits from our specified complexity. So it is still highly improbable that any of these people will get a thousand heads in a row. Now, remember we said our universe was finite, okay? Well, there's an estimated 10 to the 80th elementary particles in the universe. Those are particles that cannot be split. 
So those are what we're going to consider our actors, because if there's only 10 to the 80 particles, you can't possibly have more than 10, 10 to the 80 actors trying to do something. And then for attempts, um, uh, the Big Bang timeline um, says that there can't have been more than 10 to the 70 state transitions per particle, and I think that's based on Planck time. Therefore, there is no way to ever assert that anything has been attempted more than 10 to the 70th times in the history of the universe. So if we multiply these together, we can use our power rules to come out with the fact that the total number um, of attempts that anything could possibly have is 10 to the 150th. And so the log of this is about 498, and we'll round to 500 so that we can easily memorize it, since we're upper bounding this anyway. Okay, so 500 bits. Um, so this is known as the universal probability bound. Um, and so if you have something that is uh, less probable than this, it's probably not ever happened. And I should point out that it's ridiculous to think that every particle in the universe could be contributing to a probability distribution. So this is meant to be not only a universal bound, it's supposed to be ridiculously Im improbable. Um, so 500 bits is the most for any given probability ever in the history of the universe. So if you're looking at a, at a sequence that is um, that has occurred sometime somewhere in the history of the universe and wondering if it happened by chance, we can now know. If we subtract 500 from the algorithmic specified complexity and the answer is still positive, then not only is it unlikely to have occurred by chance now, it's unlikely to have occurred by chance any time in the entire history of the universe. Okay. So, so far, we've talked about algorithmic specified complexity. How does this relate to the specified complexity often men mentioned by intelligent design? And the fact is they are very close. Uh, specified complexity is basically um, algorithmic specified complexity with the extensions that we've talked about. So we have, it's you take algorithmic specified complexity, you factor out natural law, and you take into account the universal probability bound. So the formula for specified complexity is the physical complexity of the sequence given our background hypothesis minus the Komolgorov complexity of the sequence uh, minus 500. And uh, this formula, uh, the formula given by Dembski is the same, just using a different notation. It has a negative log two of 2 to the 500th, he actually oftentimes gives it as 10 to the 150, um, and then phi sub s of t, that's basically um, the Komolgorov complexity, um, but he also, phi sub s can also include other types of, of specification, as we mentioned earlier, multiplied by the, by the probability distribution given a background of natural law. Therefore, if any object exhibits specified complexity, we have sufficient warrant for inferring that it is designed. So anyway, so that's that's specified complexity, how it was built. And so um, I hope, you know, if you have criticisms of specified complexity, I hope you give the criticism in terms of what we've presented, not in terms of how it might be applied to biology, which we can get to later, but to, to keep in mind that, you know, what specified complexity is, what it is supposed to tell you, and whether or not it successfully does so. Um, and kind of separate out the, the bare formula, the algorithmic specified complexity, from its extensions, because I think that's also important. Um, if someone criticizes specified complexity, are you criticizing the bare question of whether or not a sequence is unusual, or are you questioning the background information? Are you questioning whether or not uh, we've properly factored something out? Are you questioning the, the, the method of inferring design from the compression? So um, those are things to keep in mind. Um, 
and maybe we'll talk about a specified complexity of particular objects later on. Thank you very much.